So welcome to the SNF Spotlight Series. Today we have the privilege to have Kathleen O'Connor. She's the president of Achieve Accreditation. So Kathleen, thank you so much for joining the SNF Spotlight. Thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you started Achieve Accreditation. I have a undergraduate in healthcare management and a master's degree in gerontology. So I consider myself a gerontologist. And why am I a gerontologist? Probably having positive age, aging role models growing up as a kid. My grandparents uh, immigrated from Ireland and we had one big house. So we had a two flat in the city and we had a wonderful experience with, with living and growing up with an extended family. And that kind of translated into a love for the elderly, love for their stories, love for uh, just all the wealth of information they brought to our family. So I'm one of those people who have a teacher that changed their life. You know, you always hear one teacher could change your life. That actually happened to me. I was in undergrad and I was assigned in, in class. Research one company that you think you might like to work at when you get out of school. So I had no idea. And this is really before the internet and you know all of the things that uh, ways people can research fast. So it was literally being in a library, going through journals, looking at things. And I came across the Joint Commission. I read a little bit about it and the concepts were that it was an organization who was totally dedicated. Everything they were about was improving. Improving quality, improving safety, and I was hooked. Then and there I knew when I got out of school that's what I would do and that's what I would pursue. And here I am 33 years later. So you originally started as a gerontologist? My undergrad is in geriatrics, so not, you know, a little bit of the, you get exposed to a broad-based degree of, you know, the f governmental side of it, the uh, social side of it, the uh, financial side of aging, all of the pieces, uh, very broad-based master's degree in gerontology. And at the time I was getting a master's degree, you know, 27 years ago, there, were only, there weren't many. <laughs> and I remember going to, being in grad school and people said, this is a good degree because one day, you know, everyone's going to be turning 65. Everyone's, we're going to have all these, you know, centenarians. And sure enough, you know, that's what's happening now. The demographics are changing and you know, aging is a cool thing. Everyone's doing it. That's right, every day. <laughs> yeah. Whether we like it or not. What inspired you to create the Achieve Accreditation? It was almost a decade in the making. So I'm so thankful for my background at the Joint Commission. I learned so much. I got exposed to all the different wonderful healthcare associations that were out there. I learned about standards of practice for business, for healthcare and really had such a broad base uh, background. But I had a little whispering in my ear, you know, throughout the time that what would it be like to be on the other side of the fence? So we can write these standards of back practice, we can tell organizations what they should do, how they should be better, what they should be doing for stretch goals, but what if I was actually helping with those stretch goals? Wouldn't that make a bigger impact on my life that you know, at the end of my life, that not only had I helped write the standards, which is, was a wonderful experience, what if I actually helped improve and was with the providers on, the, on that side? And that side of the fence, by the way, is, is a much more difficult side of the fence, a lot more challenges. A lot more challenges. Yes. Right. The Joint Commission is the nation's oldest and largest accrediting body. So anything you could name in healthcare, they have accreditation standards for it. So really is a comprehensive, wonderful organization, very mission-driven, and again, to improve quality and safety across the country. Um, the other neat thing about the Joint Commission is people think the Joint Commission writes standards. They don't actually write the standards. They bring in the expertise of the field. So everyone that touches senior living is a part of those standard development. So everybody weighs in, and then even further than that, they're field tested. So it isn't like, let's just have a meeting and, you know, flip out the standards, it's alpha tested, beta tested, you know, is this really going to make a difference so that the organization has to spend their time and energy on this? Is this going to improve care and services? So it's a very collaborative process with the industry. You were initially part of the Joint Commission. How long were you there for? And what would you say, like, for example, the change from RUGS to PDPM? Is that a Joint Commission? A lot of the state and federal regulatory pieces why we align and we were familiar with it because but there's not it's it's privatization so with joint commission there is not a tie to the government um, I'll explain later about the funding when we talk more about how there is some, some quality incentives now 
but probably the changes that I saw with Joint Commission, um, when the skilled nursing organization started, it started like around 64, 65 that they started accrediting skilled nursing facilities. There wasn't the interest that there is now. Value-based purchasing has really put Joint Commission on the map for skilled nursing providers looking to brand, looking to up their game, looking to catch the attention of hospital providers because hospital providers, that's all they, that, that is their body, that is their survey body. So a quick way to uh, impress, you know, people that are making discharges to you is to say, we're Joint Commission accredited now. So it's the nation's highest level of standards. Again, very, very well known in the referral organizations and knowing that when they partner with somebody who's Joint Commission accredited, knowing the rigor that they had to go, go through to get that. Is there a rating within that of like, who's higher on the Joint Commission, yeah. who's lower? It's funny that you asked that because there, there was, and I, I want to go back in my memory and say it was around probably when I was there about 15 years ago. They had something called accreditation with commendation, but they found it was counterproductive. You know, we're all humans, and even though they're very standardized, you know, there's a the human element to a survey, and it was creating an incentive that, you know, kind of put people in crazy-making mode. So they decided instead to, it's accredited with recommendations and you know some organizations would you know possibly get more recommendation than others but they do need to clear the recommendations before they're to become joint commission accredited and then the survey initially you do invite them in they come to your building and we'll talk more about that with the skilled versus you know there's some other parts of the skilled nursing facilities too so they do come to your building invited and it's a lengthy process, and we'll get we'll have some time to talk about that too. But the resurveys are every three years, so, but you don't really say, okay, well that's it, close up shop, you know, we're done. You have to keep things in place, continuous quality improvement and safety, and be able to demonstrate that, that during that three year period that you made the commitment to the Joint Commission standards. Right. So there are about fifteen thousand plus skilled nursing facilities in the U.S. How many of them would you say are Joint Commission approved? still a small percentage. I think when you're looking at accreditation, it's probably better to talk about it at the state level because there's variance. And this kind of jumps into, you know, why accreditation has gotten more on the map. For example, our own state here of Illinois. It was about eight years ago that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois told nursing homes in the Collar counties that if you want to be in the PPO network, we're going to want, we're going to want accreditation. So that significantly increase the number of Illinois facilities. Go back 15 years when you know, it was man more managed care, we were calling it, not value-based purchasing. That happened in Massachusetts. Go back now eight years and Florida. Florida is a very unique situation. Florida was the first time where a state came forward and said, we're going to reward quality. So if you are willing to hold yourself to higher standards, you know, put structure, processes, and outcome measures in place, we will reward that financially. So what happened in Florida, and that's why it's a good one to look at the percentage, you were less than 5% that were accredited in Florida, and it went to 56% came forward. And there was obviously a financial incentive piece for that because they would receive more Medicaid dollar revenues. And now just recently in the last few weeks, the same thing has happened in Georgia. A neighboring state saw that, you know, by improving quality, putting you know higher structures in place for expectation stretch goals, I like to call them, that that rewards, that re everybody wins. You know, the providers win when obviously the, the quality is incentivized and also the residents, the family and the staff win when you're trying to make improvements that are gonna benefit Absolutely. Safety, safety and quality. Give me a little bit more about uh, Achieve Accreditation. Okay, Achieve Accreditation, you know, if you look at Joint Commission is what we're looking for for standards, we would be the how-to. So we will come in and do a gap analysis like most consulting companies. So, you know, we all have to start with where are you at now, where you need to get to from A to Z. And what we do is, I, I like to think of it as a funnel approach. So we'll come in and assess an organization and we'll determine what are you doing that, let's not change it, there's no reason to change it. This totally meets the intent of the standard. You're, you know, five stars, you're, let's move on to the next item. If you look at the filtering down, you know, what are we doing, what do the standards require, there'll be a gap in between where it'll, you'll kind of meet the mark of, we're doing this, 
but maybe we're not using the data data and turning in its information, or maybe we're not you know checking off all the boxes related to the standard or the intents. And then you'll have a group standards where we never did this, we're not doing it, we have nothing to show for that. And you know what we always tell our clients is no shame, no blame, because you didn't have to do it. You weren't joint commission accredited before, so this is new. And yes, there's some moving pieces to this. You know, some things might be a simple, you know, meeting or two to kind of put this in place and sustain it at the organization. Other things, I like to use the phrase, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Because there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of steps in this process. And for that reason, you take a little bite. You know, you take a little bite, you get that under your plate, uh, you, you, know, you train the staff, you, you make competency tests, what's required and then start putting things in place for implementation. Because remember, it's not just about passing the survey. You know, the mission, if you go back to the mission of the Joint Commission, it is to improve the quality and the safety. So, you know, you, you wanna have a pace that's steady enough to move forward towards the goal of accreditation, but not so quick that you just, you know, crammed for a test like in college, you know, pulled an all-nighter. You really want to make sustainable change at your organization. I guess maybe if you can give us a little rundown of the specific things that a nursing home would need to get accredited. Like, what are they focusing on? There are two buckets, really, if you want to think about it that way. There's the resident care side of the bucket, and then there's the kind of the, the, the business processes and pieces. So, for example, human resources, environment of care, infection prevention and control so you know and then there's a lot on the resident side as well so there's those two components and our t team likes to put everything into two buckets when we're preparing so we like to house everything under it's either quality improvement or it's safety so there's not a standard in there that you couldn't really connect to one of those because if not why would you ask a provider out of their busy crazy busy days to be doing something that's not going to add value to the organization so, and that's, you know, of the hundreds, maybe thousands of organizations that we have worked with to get accredited in these last 33 years and working, you know, both at the Joint Commission and well as at Achieve Accreditation, I've never had an organization told me we're not better because of this. So that to me is, you know, the gold standard of why you'd want to do it. You know, a lot of people will say, I've been wanting to do this for years. And, you know, they'll pull out a list from their drawer and say, I actually have been talking about this with the leadership team to do this. Well, now you have to do it because it's, it's good practice and it's required by the standards. So I would say, you know, the, the benchmark good reason is that you're going to improve your organization. But there are other reasons. And let's face it, you have to have, in you know, today's world of pros and cons and where we're spending dollars, there has to be other reasons. So I'll give a couple of examples, which some I've already shared. But you know, the Medicaid 2% increase is, is, a big, is a big deal. So you would be rewarded for the time that you spent and the energy that you spent, not only by getting a stronger organization with structure, processing, and outcome, and the sense of pride that staff have from you know, putting these goals in front of themselves and really coming together to collaborate and really improve what they do. The other side of the fence is even those organizations that are not doing the 2% Medicaid, you know, I encourage skilled nursing providers across all the states to t talk to their commercial providers because, you know, while they may not at this point be giving the 2% 2, 2 Medicaid, there's definitely a feather in their cap to have accreditation. So there's a lot of providers, th third-party insurance providers, who, you know, when they go through their checklist of things and organizations they want to align with or, you know, when they do their audits of the organization that they're, you know, uh, working with, you know, everybody in those arenas know who's, who knows who Joint Commission is and it's definitely a feather in the cap. Another reason, again, you know, the competition zone that we're all in, no matter where you're at, what state you're in, you know, if there's a group of nursing homes, skilled nursing providers in a community, Everybody is, you know, vying for the same residents. And to be able to say to the hospital, you know, we're, we're a cut above, we're, we've done something different here, really creates a lot of strength to the referral and it really catches people's attention. Yeah, so it's the credibility. It's like when someone's joint commission approved, the hospitals feel much more comfortable right. Right. sending them. So you, you had mentioned that there were certain states that have been giving a 2% increase on the Medicaid reimbursement for any nursing home that's Joint Commission approved. So what states are we talking right about? Right now it's Florida um, and just recently Georgia and there are other states we're, I'm told you know, under consideration and you know it's just kind of hit the market and 
as everybody looks to kind of you know rebrand and look at the ways they can repackage themselves, particularly after the hit our poor industry took after COVID, you know, it's just another another third party way where you can say, you know, someone came in and right. evaluated us and we met these uh, high level of expectations. Right. So Achieve has really been you as the president and founder have been at the right place at the right time. I mean, I guess you've been doing this for a long time and now is the time that it may just explode if every state takes on this new. Yeah, you know, you can never guess what the government's going to do, but I, I'm very pleased to see that people are being re reimbursed at a higher rate when they put greater effort forward and, and move forward with quality. I can't think of anything better to make an incentive than quality. What other accreditations are there? What others exist and do you sure. also help sure. your clients? Yes, glad you asked that one. First of all, as it goes back to the Joint Commission, as I said, anything in healthcare can be accredited by the Joint Commission. I'll give some examples. So hospitals, home care, durable medical equipment, behavioral health, ambulatory health care, on and on and on, you name it in healthcare, there's either standards for accreditation or certification standards. In the skilled umbrella, we have skilled nursing accreditation, which goes by the name of nursing care center accreditation. So that is, you know, what you would think of as your basic SNF that would be moving forward, but they have options. So if they get nursing care center accreditation, that's a wonderful, you know, opportunity to tell the industry we talked about some of the Medicaid reimbursement, but there are also some optional pieces. You can go for something called post-acute certification. So that is a subset of an add-on to the Nursing Care Center accreditation. And that really is if you want to distinguish yourself as the you know, post-acute expert. So these are often your short-stay patients, you know, uh, acute medical kinds of things, or ortho rehab. Um, these are people that often return to a lower level of care. Sometimes they'll, you know, discharge and depending on the conditions, stay in the skilled nursing. But for the most part, they're usually the plan is to go home. So that is a real opportunity for organizations who really want to, to take care of that population to have a great feather in their cap to say that they're post-acute certified. There's also an option for memory care certification. So many organizations really have that in their niche. So they really want to show the community that not only are they providing memory care services, but they're providing at a level of excellence. So those, again, optional with the Nursing Care Center accreditation. There's one that's actually outside the skilled nursing facility that I will mention, though, because I think it has merit for the skilled providers. Not all, but some skilled providers also have an assisted living component. So Joint Commission went live on July 1st with the assisted living accreditation program. So now for the first time, they're gonna be able to have that part of the continuum accredited or freestanding assisted living will be able to have this recognition as well. Achieve accreditation, you know, we made a really eggs in, our, eggs in one basket decision many, many years ago. We decided to be a true expert. I couldn't dabble in hospitals. I couldn't dabble in home care. I couldn't dabble in behavioral health. I could, but then I was weakening our knowledge base. So I really made the decision that there was enough uh, quality and safety items that needed to be proved in the skilled market. And that's where we were gonna, if we were gonna be true experts that our clients would come to us and really trust us for that level of expertise, we made a decision and you know, many years back turned down to business and, and the other components because you can't be an expert in everything. And um, if you try to be an expert in too many things, then you sometimes give up a little bit of that expertise. Uh, you can't do the deeper dive on knowledge. So we, again, we, we, organizations could look to us for help for nursing care center accreditation, post-acute certification, memory care certification, and now the new assisted living accreditation standards, all under the senior living umbrella. Do you feel like maybe the consumers themselves feel more comfortable when they, they're accredited in specific areas? I definitely know that the marketing directors and the sales team will educate you know, the difference between this organization and maybe the one down the street. So I think there's always some variance where you're looking to just draw distinctions. So I think there is a, and I think baby boomers, you know, people shopping for their parents' care, they're pretty educated, you know. They're not just, they're coming in with a list of questions. And, you know, Joint Commission accreditation, you know, may not be the deal breaker for why they choose it, but it certainly shows me if I'm shopping as a daughter for my mom or dad's care, that this is an organization who went the extra yard. They're committed to quality. So I think there, there is that factor.
How long would you typically, does it take for a nursing home to go from nothing to becoming Joint Commission accredited? That, yeah, that's, that, there's some variance in the answer. I do know that when there's pushing of these third party drivers, you know, organizations are willing to be able to commit more resources and go at a faster pace. Achieve accreditation as a company, we usually have recommendations on that. Because again, I want sustainable change. I don't want to just come in and, and cram and have you pass the survey. We want to improve quality and safety with you as a partner and be on this journey with you. If you look at the birthing process of nine months, I like to use that analogy. You know, you're giving birth to a new culture, a new culture of safety and quality. You know, nine months is, you know, a great time frame. We don't often get that time frame in life. Life goes faster than that. You know, we push and move and, and, and move quicker. I would say, you know, at a minimum, you know, closer you can get to the six months would be good, but we have done it in four months with organizations um, on a quicker pace as long as they're willing to commit the resources to come to the table with us on the Zoom meeting and you know do the little bites of the elephant at a time we can do that I think anything quicker than that you're kind of cheating yourself out of some of the value that comes from the process because it, it is not it's a culture change it's not a, a cramming or a, an exam and passing it because it goes on you know the accreditation standards expectations will be with you forever then once you make that decision to become Joint Commission accredited. So even just reading the standards takes some time and to absorb that. Even with the help of, you know, a consulting company, you know, you still have a little bit of a learning curve and you know, someone may be holding your hand in that process, but you still have to sustain change. And, and the other thing I always tell providers too is with all the things that you have working on you and your staff, you know, with residents, family, staff, pandemics, you don't want this to be the thing that burns people out, you know. This this needs to energize the group, not, you know, burn people out. So for that reason, while you could push faster, it wouldn't be a recommendation that Achieve Accreditation would have with their clients. So, you know, six to nine months is ideal. Four months during these periods of uh, the Medicaid dollar incentives makes sense. I used to answer that question 10 years ago, take a year, <laughs> but everything moves faster in every industry. So nine months would be a long end of the answer. And Four months, I wouldn't recommend any faster than that. So what would you say some of the biggest challenges that nursing homes are facing that they're not ready necessarily to be, uh, you know, to take that survey? Well, obviously, you know, the pandemic has been one of the, you know, things that our industry has been hit with. And we're with a favorite industry to be picked on anyways, right? So that just gave fuel to the fire. I think people are still catching their breath and, you know, we don't even know where we're at with COVID yet. You know, there still could be another wave. So I think people are catching their breath, but it's an industry that no, learns, no, knows how to pivot. You know, they've had so many regulatory changes in, in state and federal. And, you know, my experience has been with, with the bad comes a lot of good. And I don't necessarily mean COVID. Obviously, that was a terrible thing to happen and all the deaths, but I'm talking about when you really get broke down to the lowest level, really knocked down, you have everywhere to go but up, right? And organizations are looking, okay, so what did we learn in that process? How do we put systems in place? And many of the things, people may have done a much deeper dive on their infection prevention control during the COVID crisis. Those things have been in the Drain Commission standards for, you know, 50 years. So things that they found themselves doing, stretching, to new heights because of the challenges they were having. Well, here's a framework that, you know, can make that a permanent part of your culture. Would you say that an organization or a nursing home that was joint commission approved uh, had better outcomes during COVID, were less affected? I haven't seen the COVID studies yet, but I can, I can tell you for going back 10, you know, 10 or more years, you can go back and look at the joint commission's website, www jointcommission.com and you can see a lot of third-party independent studies showing that nursing homes who are joint commission accredited they do better on their state and their federal surveys so there is a link there of that you know you could say which came first the chicken or the egg did people get accredited because they were already seeking quality but there is definitely third party outside of joint commission studies that were done and I would direct people to the the joint commission website to read that you know I think we're still on the COVID because I don't think there's been a, you know, debriefing yet from that, but I would imagine that you'll find that. I know, I do know that when we were going through the crisis with our organizations and still are, 
Um, we were hearing a lot of things, no wonder there's a standard on that. <laughs> now it makes sense. I used to always wonder, why is there a standard on that? And now we're, we're seeing the merit. We heard anecdotally, you know, in our couple hundred clients that they were better prepared because they were accredited. And they felt that the resources and the expectations of the Joint Commission had them thinking at a different level and that they felt more prepared than they otherwise would have been. A lot of the healthcare space definitely did a pivot, it, you know, got stuck in the gutter for the past uh, year and a half or so. Uh, how did the Joint Commission and achieve accreditation, how did they pivot and shift their focus? Well, let me answer achieve accreditation first. I think a lot of businesses went to bed that night and said, am I an essential worker <laughs> when all this happened? Because nobody knew what end was up. We were quite fortunate that we have always been able to Zoom. We were Zooming before people were Zooming. We were able to take our iPad and, and travel, you know, go around the building with the maintenance director and the infection preventionist and the administrator and the team, which, quite frankly, the biggest reason was it's a big, it's a big saver of money, you know, to not have to pay a consultant to come out, fly out, stay for a couple nights in a hotel, have their meals, all that gets reimbursed. We were always seeing that the business model needed to be very fluid, and we learned even before COVID that there wasn't a lot that you had to be on site for. And I think old school told us that you did, you know, but it, we were it had already had a couple of years under our belt of proving that. So for us, it was natural for our clients. You know, our, many of our clients, they'd only had seen us on Zoom, so there was no, you know, on-site visits to cancel. Others who had seen us in a combination model, of both on-site and in person, felt very comfortable with the caliber of our services through Zoom. You know, people were a bit shell-shocked, you know. I mean, there was a definite concentration on what to do and how to improve, but also there were days where it felt like a therapy session because these poor people were going through so much and just explaining what was happening, you know, losing staff, losing residents. Very difficult times, and I know everybody is aware of that, but, you know, just what those folks did it, to this day is just amazing to me. And that's why it's so it's so hurtful that our industry always is, you know, the scapegoat for negative comments. And But uh, they rose above and really, you know, answered the call, answered the call to provide quality and safety, even despite the bad media and all the things that were happening. They just took care of the residents and took care of each other, the, the staff. So for us, the pivot was easy. There was really no pivot, you know, other than, you know, having to be more flexible and the timing and, you know, working with people and where they were at in their COVID process. Joint Commission actually went to remote survey process. So initially, they were very respectful of the field and they didn't do any surveys, kind of like other um, survey organizations did the same. It just wasn't the time or the place. So I think there was that initial drop off, but then it became, well, this is probably the new normal, right? So we still have to keep looking at quality and safety. So they took, for example, their two days skilled nursing, nursing care center accreditation, and one of those days was done in a remote, and then a later date was to be the on-site. And now they're catching up with those on-sites and making sure that they're getting to the organizations. But I think, you know, they had not done remotes before. My experience is that our clients felt they were getting every bit of a good quality product in the remote and that there wasn't anything that they had felt cheated on, that they didn't get a, you know, a rigorous review of their compliance. So once again, just shows that the world has gotten pretty remote. You've been in the field for 33 years, having a career in healthcare. What are some of the professional takeaways? I would say, you know, working in, in geriatrics, I think my heart hurts sometimes you know, when I read an article in a newspaper or see something on the news and it's negative. But I think my professional takeaway has been, you know, really alliance to the providers, you know, watching people sacrifice so much of their personal, professional lives, their families, all that they give to the residents. That, you know, is something very personal to me. I would also say that I kind of have family members or friends who might say, oh, nursing homes, uh, they, you know, why would you ever want to be in a nursing home, you know? And I like to do education at that point, you know, whether it's a family member or a friend and say, well, there's plenty of people who don't have the resources or they extend the resources of their family, you know, what if someone's a two-person assist? You know, their wife's not going to be able to take care of them. There's a big gap and a big void that they fill. But I also like to turn it back to, I think it's an issue with our society more than it is with the nursing homes. You know, we are a youth-based society. Look at the Botox rates. 
<laughs> right? All we care about is when you're young, when you're when you're retired, you know, what's your role in this society? We struggle with that as a society. We really put value and I, you know, my answer is always until our society, you know, can honor our seniors and and honor the people that work in those industries and make it, you know, well paid, make it a respectful position. You know, you can't blame the nursing homes. You can't they're doing the best they can with the resources they have. Those are very hard jobs. You know, I had a personal experience where my mom had a stroke and she was in a skilled nursing post rehab, post acute rehab. And, you know, watching the care, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, my back was, was killing me after just learning transfers and doing what I had to do. And I'm looking at these, you know, 25-year-old young women who now have back problems, you know, and even if they're transferring, it's a tough job. You know, you're in the lives of families, you're in the lives of residents, and it's messy. Life is messy. So, you know, I feel... You know, if people really could see the nursing homes from the inside and the commitment they have to quality and safety and, you know, some of that media would, you know, take a different spin. You know, it's, I guess, bad news sells and that, that, that's that been a takeaway to me that, that it, all I can do as one person is educate. So I guess my biggest takeaway is I would defend the skilled nursing industry right, left and center anytime time it comes up. Yeah, it's just, I, you know, everybody comes to work to do, do, a, do a good job. Yeah. And, uh, when you're dealing with human lives, not to undermine retail or any other kind of industries, but that's some heavy stuff. And, you know, I, I stand behind, you know, the nursing home industry. And, you know, it, and when you see the media events, that's very upsetting too. But it's like, you know, bad things can happen in, in good places. You know, this is just life. Life is messy. It's not, it's not a straight path. And aging is tough. Aging is not for sissies. I just hope that when people start to understand our industry a little better, that they'll see the human side of it. Staff becoming the family of residents, residents who've lost all their family members or had no family members. You know, I can't think of a more important job. Yeah. So, Kathleen, I mean, this is exactly what we're trying to do in the SNF Spotlight. That was the purpose. That was the goal, is to bring out from the inside about what's really going on, because it's one of the most challenging positions ever. So Kathleen, thank you so much for, you know, coming on to the SNF Spotlight. I really appreciate it and sharing with us and helping the industry. Thank you. I appreciate the offer to be here.